Welcome back, Purchasoids. It's uh, a Purchasoids. great day. Purchasoids, yes. All right. It's a great day in Northern Michigan. Good to have you all with us again. As you may recall from our last conversation, we're really talking about um, the challenges facing the, the next generation. And did we leave them in the soup? You know, did we make a mess? And and the, the answer is partially yes. The answer is partially no. But how, how are you doing today, Tree? I am well, Toby. How are you? I am fantastic. We're rocking the Detroit Tigers uh, jersey today. Uh, as we know, the Detroit Tigers are perennial cellar dwellers, but we love them anyway up here in Northern Michigan. <laughs> God bless them, little puddings. Anyway, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is one of the one of the major topics we're going to want to talk about is 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 wealth actually de you know de de decreasing as we're getting into into other generations. And we were just talking about this before we even started filming, and it's really not true that 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 wealth is actually decreasing. What we're finding is. Um, in some cases, it's career choices, and in some cases, it's just that the uh, the the gap. Now, don't between... say we. That's what you okay. found. Okay. All right. Okay. You don't know if that's what I found. That's true. That's, that's your true. opinion. That's what we're finding, totally though, is is that the cost of living in general is going up faster than people are making money. So uh, the one I wanted to start with, if you're good with it, was was housing. Mm -hmm. Can we start there? Okay. Absolutely. So, talk about this a little bit. We hear about it, you know, and and. Tree said this on the last podcast. Both she and I have have uh, children who are millennials, right? Is that mm -hmm. what we said? You know, so, no, uh, no. Oh, Gen X? Z. Gen Z. Okay. See, I'm, I don't even keep these. Gen straight. X is me. Ah, okay. So Gen Z. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of my, uh, my son is in, the, uh, is in the workforce. My daughter just getting there. And both of them look at it and say, Dad, you know, housing is just ridiculously expensive, you know can't afford to buy a house. And you look at it and say, well, wait a minute, how could, how could we have done it? Because I look at salaries and I say, well, you know, my son makes more at his age than he did when I was his age. So what's happened? So let me give you a couple quick numbers and then we'll, we'll jump into the conversation. So I'm sure our numbers in, aren't the same. In, 19, in 1984, the median household income, 1984. So I got out of college in 85. So 84, the median household income, you want to guess? Twenty five thousand. Twenty two thousand. Oh, mm -hmm. If it price is right, you would have been over. You would have lost. So sorry. But it was not. It's not. So you're okay. All right. Twenty two thousand four hundred dollars. An average house. What did an average house in nineteen eighty four cost? What did we just do? What did I just give you? You just gave me household income. Oh, household income. That's what you gave me. Twenty two thousand okay. four twenty was household income. What was the house? Thirty seven thousand. Oh gosh, I wish seventy eight thousand two hundred dollars. What's it there? Seventy eight. The median price for a house. Oh, what year? Nineteen eighty four. Oh, eighty. Okay. okay. So if you take twenty two four four twenty and seventy eight two hundred, the ratio is about three and a half to one. Okay, mm -hmm. three and a half household income to house cost. Okay, three and a half to one. Let's go to twenty twenty two. All right, twenty twenty two median household income. Want to guess? You can't cheat. You're gonna cheat. I can't cheat. You can't cheat. Uh, That's right. 250000 Oh, you wish. Who, 22, what, what, oh, what, what, what world do you live in? Maybe in pesos for God's sake. 350000 What? Median household income? Oh, income. I thought you said house. I can't hear. Oh, okay, let's start over. Please send your... <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Please medium send your money operators are standing by. Oh. Median household income. Median household income. 75000 Very close once you're actually... Pay attention to my question. Seventy-four thousand six hundred. I said seventy-four thousand. I know. That's why I said you're dangerously close. Oh my Down god. Down from whatever one point two million that you had a minute oh, ago. So we're whatever. Good. We're good. Okay. And now, let's talk about the average house cost. Which is what I thought you said the first time. You know, I have a radar where I tune you out. It's kind of hard to tune in just for a podcast. Yeah. But I'm I'm tuning in Tokyo. I'm here. So. Median household. Two hundred fifty thousand. Four hundred thirty-three thousand. And therein lies the rub. Okay. And 2022. So now, 2022. What was the it? Well, we cost, made a huge jump because it was just 250000 The, in the it. average household cost, median That's house cost, 2022, $433,000. Okay, where are we going? So now the gap is 5.8 to 1. Okay. So while income went up very steadily, housing costs went up exponentially. And you got to ask yourself, why? Why did this happen? Well, two things. One of them is, you may remember the loose lending practices in, in the year 2000s, where we were giving basically mortgages to anybody who had a, a, a pulse. Um, and then you had to bail out the banks. We had all kinds of challenges around that. 
uh, was it too big to fail, you know, all of that. And then after that, we had super low interest rates, super low interest rates. Then we didn't have enough inventory in the market, drove pricing up like crazy. So now the affordability index is a mess. See you. So I'm going in a different direction. Shocking. Okay. I knew that was next. And, and this is what I have to say about housing. So because we left, the first one was about different generations and where they fare. And we mm -hmm. said we're going to talk about it from through, through the lens of housing. Well, 73 million baby boomers in the U.S. They retire in 2030, yet 45 percent, listen to this, of baby boomers have no retirement or savings. They are becoming homeless at a rate not seen since the Great Depression. So think about that when we get to the finger pointing, that's how we started in the last one, when we said, well, this is the biggest transfer of wealth. And yes, that's true. Yes, they all retire. And yes, that's, that's going to pull on SSI. But you have to realize too, not only, so here's a generation that when we look at it from, you know, pointing a finger, it says the biggest transfer of wealth because they had it. But here's a generation that's going to work longer, mm -hmm. that cannot retire. Mm -hmm. When they retire, 45% of them don't have any savings or retirement. But I have some more numbers that, that like literally took my breath away too. So I'm going to break this down also. Before I get into this, I, I also want to say um, there is a disparity. And I thought I had the, the notes for this. And I may, oh, Why don't you look for that for a second? Because I want to I mm -hmm. I wanna pile on that. Mm -hmm. I was just reading something the other day. Um, I am just turned 60 this year. And so you start to look at things like, how much money do I need to retire? And I heard an economist, I think... Could have been Susie Orman or somebody on one of the, the morning That's shows. Mm -hmm. And they said that for you to, to retire comfortably at age 65, you should have about between $1.4 and $1.5 million. And that's up markedly in the last 10 years. And again, why? We talked about some of it, the inflation challenges and pricing, pricing um, demands. But the other thing they said is that what's the average 65-year-old got in savings? And it was like $87,000. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a big gap from 87000 to $1.4 million. So that speaks directly to your point, which is while, while you know, millennials or Gen Zs or Gen Xs or whomever mm -hmm. can, can, can you know, point the finger, um, we're going to have some real challenges here coming up pretty soon as, as the baby boomers start to retire and start to realize that they don't have enough money to retire and our, our, our life expectancies uh, have just continued to increase. Well, another thing, it's two issues. And um, and I don't want it to sound like all doom and gloom, but I think you cannot change what you don't acknowledge. So some of this is just informational. Um, and it, these numbers don't sound good. But in 2022, <laughs> this part sounds good in theory. In 2022, <laughs> nearly 40% of the U.S. homeowners own their homes outright, according to the Census Bureau data in Bloomington. In total, 33.3 million single-family homes and condos mortgage were mortgage-free. 31%, that's a 31% increase compared to 25.4 million a decade ago, right? So that sounds great. That sounds hopeful. This is where I got a knot in my stomach. There's such a huge disparity that now let's talk about, because we talked about um, the generations, but the racial disparity. 41 million African-Americans in the U.S., that's 12%. Um, that's in 2021, which is 331 million. Um, on the average, the numbers, and this is according to NAR, and NAR is the National Association of Realtors. Uh, majority of those homeowners are of the 33%, and I had the actual number somewhere right here, are white. The numbers cannot be stated of African Americans who own their homes. There is literally no data mm -hmm. stating of that percentage of homeowners in America, what percentage of that that are African Americans. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we've talked about this. That makes me want to cry because what that says is go back to how did this go? What does this have to do with generation and, and, and different generations? Well, historically in America, the reason why, you know, people have an issue with boomers is because of the money. And historically in America, the biggest transfer of wealth, the way to earn wealth is between education mm-hmm. and home ownership. So if it's barely, and I'll get to the numbers soon, I don't want to make this a, a race thing because that's a, a, another podcast for a different day because it's such a disparity in the rate of home ownership uh, for African-Americans. But if we barely own our homes in a low percentage. And when we do, we never own them outright. Mm-hmm. So how do you ever close this? So you got a racial wealth gap in the generations and racially. Mm-hmm. So the numbers are so skewed, you know, and it makes me sad to know that like, how can you make this up when there's no, there's no avenue to close these gaps? Well, not only that, but, and we've talked about this on previous podcasts, but Think of it like a race, right? And, and if, if, if I start a mile ahead of you and I, we are both running at the same speed, you know, an hour later, guess what? I'm still a mile ahead of you. <laughs> and that's unfortunately the, the world that we find ourselves in. Or a lot of the numbers I see is that minorities are making up you know, a minute of, of that hour, you know, but that's just so slow. Mm-hmm. So that the, the, some of the economists will say, oh, the... The black community in- income is is increasing at three percent, whereas the white income is increasing at four percent. But remember, that's a percentage of where they started. So in reality, in real terms, minorities are actually falling further behind mm-hmm. because if I have a million dollars at four percent versus twenty five thousand dollars at five percent, I'm still losing ground, and that's what's happening. So it's 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 kind of a shell game. This what they're trying to describe. Yeah. And, let and me, generational wealth is the biggest challenge. Yeah. You, you nailed it. And and since I brought that up, I thought it's fair that I give the actual numbers. One, the U.S. home ownership rate increased 65 percent in 2021. The rate of African American lags significantly at 44 percent. Has only increased 0.4 percent in 10 years, mm-hmm. and is nearly 29 percent points less than white Americans at 72, representing the largest black-white home ownership rate gap in decades. And then it goes on to say, but this is what I want to say, black home owners and renters are most cost burden than any other racial group. Less than 10% of black renters can afford to, to buy their typical homes. And the reason why I felt like bringing that up is because when we just gave the numbers previously about the a historic high of home ownerships, mm-hmm. people that have mortgage free, mm-hmm. the reason that the article, and you can look this up and I'll put the link on it from NAR, the National Association um, of Realtors, they said the reason why that jumped significantly, think about it. So when we were going through the pandemic or we were going through what we went through, when we looked up and we saw that interest rates had fell in the twos, so all of these seniors that were close to the close to the end of their mortgage, you know, they refi got their low interest, paid mm-hmm. it off, mm-hmm. you know, quick. So therefore, that's why home and home ownership actually owning your home outright with no mortgage made this jump. Well, which is great and that's fantastic, but they could do that because they had it, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they were the number that actually had the savings where most of the the numbers are staggering with the percentage where we gave that didn't have like you said seventy five percent seventy five thousand or less mm-hmm. even in savings and then some don't have a savings at all mm-hmm. so of course when there's times when the market hits you have to have money to make money we yeah. say that all the time you know yeah. you have to have money to to take advantage of those things yeah, and, so and so there's a there was an interesting article um, when was this published twenty twenty one Uh, in Business Insider called Millennials are the highest earning generation, but hold way less wealth, which would seem like a contradiction in terms. I want to read to you a little bit. And and the the section that they call is called an affordability crisis. And it says the cost of living increases have outpaced wage increases. Some services and goods have become way more expensive than others over the last 21 years with costs for things like, see if Millennials and Gen Z think of these as important, college tuition, Healthcare and childcare far exceeding our hourly wage hikes. 
The most recent pay scale index found that wages have increased by 19% mm -hmm. in the United States since 2006. But when you factor in inflation, real wages have declined by 8.8%. That means that workers have less purchasing power than they used to. It's especially a problem for millennials who have faced one economic woe after another. Mm -hmm. Two recessions before the age of 40 and a staggering student debt load coupled with soaring living costs have created an affordability index for the generation that's even with six-figure earning feeling broke. And we, we were talking about this before we started filming and, and Mark, who does our podcast, said, you know, there's this, this delusional thought now that our educators are pushing this is, oh, you have to go to college. Oh, you have to go to college. You know, you, you have to go to college. And we're forgetting the fact that there are good vocational careers and there are other careers that perhaps don't need to go to college. And we're actually saddling our kids with these massive student debts. And then we, we explain and then we complain when they say, I can't pay my student loans or they can't afford a car payment or, you know, or these other things. Clearly, purchasing power has dropped almost nine percent in the last uh in the last 10, 15 years. Well, I'm going to say something. And I know I'm not saying this for argument's sake. It's just food for thought. I know the millennials aren't going to like it. Um, <laughs> but I, so all of those factors are true. And all of that, that, that financial burden it was laid along, was handed down to them. Unfair, unjust. I don't even believe in fair. That's a different conversation. But generations before the millennials, we did have delayed gratification. We did. Funny you we, say that. We, we get into that. We, yeah. we, we had delayed gratification. We came up. I promise you, my car was the biggest hoopty on the planet. Like, mm -hmm. literally, I would just drive down the road and my lights go, Psh. it shouldn't have been on the road. They so, went what? Psh. Okay. And like, <laughs> like, seriously, I mean, cars would start honking because I had an electrical issue and I couldn't afford to get a fit. It's just, that it shouldn't have been out there. I had a car in college, you couldn't go reverse. Yeah. Didn't go in reverse. That's what I'm saying. And I literally had raw spots and, and holes. I couldn't go through car wash because, you know, because no, it'll get wet. Ne nevertheless, but each generation had a starter, everything. That's mm. how we, in America, you had a small house. We had 800, 900 square foot home yep. and we stayed in there. Not until we got this, until our families outgrew it, and then we went to a bigger home. I want to jump. I want to pile on that. Why is it different now? Tell me why. I'm not going to tell you why I think it is, but you tell me why we put up with cars that didn't go in reverse or cars that went. Cars that because went. Because we weren't given anything. So she we had to, because there was no But why did we put up with it? Because, what and you, people today we, won't. Wait, who, why were we willing who, to put who, up with it? Who, who is we, 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 who? us, us is us. Yeah, clarify, because we're talking about our generation okay. was willing to drive cars that didn't go backwards okay. or cars that went. You missed your line again, you know, or whatever it was. <laughs> OK, we put up with that. We lived in little homes. We did. But today they don't want to do that. And why See, don't they want to do that? All, why don't they want to do that? It, you're missing your line. It's not the fact that, first of all, you, you're not saying it correctly. It's not the fact that we put up with it. Oh, yes, it that is. is not what it is. That was the only option we had. My mom used to call it duck or no dinner. That means you eat this duck or you don't eat shit. Nothing. <laughs> that that was all we had. So putting up with something meaning. So why say, are people you say thinking put up differently something now? Meaning you have an option. Right. When you put up with something. You put up with it because you have a choice. I'm right. putting up with this, but I can leave. So today. I didn't have a choice. I couldn't roller skate to work because those were the only other wheels. <laughs> so Can't why is it different bike? today? I cry. Like, why is it different today? <laughs> Why is I'm going to give you one word. No, first of all, you got to let me. So you asked me to. OK, talk, Toby. I'm done. Credit. I, so Credit. that's part. No. Well, this is what I have to say to that. And I understand that. I think my generation was the first because right after the Obama came in and and really got after may change the laws where these creditors just couldn't inundate college campuses. I think the generation, what generation is it? <laughs> generation X was the first generation that literally saw, you know, these credit card companies, like, as soon as you get to college, here you go. As soon as you get to college, here you go. So it was there mm -hmm. with generation X, but our generation, we saw the struggle. Most of us worked at a very young age. Right. How old so were you when you had, had your first credit card? Oof. That's a great question. I wouldn't take it. 
that's a whole mm-hmm. other conversation for another day. Right. I was in my twenties when I right. when I started. What do you think today? Cards. What's the average age that that somebody gets a credit card? I mean, you look at the average. I know my debt. kids got them when I. I mean, well, got banking cards and which was credit cards mm-hmm. too and access. So when they, I think they were both fifteen. Right. What, but what we're it wasn't at, that. It wasn't. They weren't balling out. It was none of that. It was I, just, I would argue that that our culture has changed to the point where. We are okay with being in debt. We're but, comfortable with but being Toby, in debt, and I it's think, frightening. I, I, I think that that's, that that's a disconnect because I understand what you're saying, but where I think the bigger point, my point was, where's the delayed gratification? Because you put it on credit cards, and I'm, I'm putting saying, it on credit. No, credit but, in but, general. But what Whether I'm it's you can get into about, this car today, or you can buy this house because of these. But sub- I'm talking about mortgages. ideology, though. I understand that, but mm-hmm. I'm talking about ideology. Where did it come? Where we felt like, you know, and I think our generation started it. I think our generation, because we wanted them to have more and said, when you graduate, you get a car. When you graduate, you get this. And the generation before them, if they got a car, it was the their parents' car that they mm-hmm. old clunker and they, and they were happy for it. Like, mm-hmm. ah, right. as long as it wasn't that station wagon with the brown wood. On the <laughs> but even if you got that, it's better than roller skates. I'm telling you, than a bus pass. Yeah. But so then we took that away and said, you know, we just, they started us off if they could. Not everyone got even a parent's car. I didn't, mm-hmm. you know, but they started us off with what they had because their thing is, you know, you earn your own. I'm giving you something to get you to point A to point B. Mm-hmm. And then we came along. And before, as soon as the kids got in high school, my my daughter, and we talked about this with our kids, went to a school where, where a kid was given a G-Wagon, mm-hmm. a Mercedes G-Wagon. Like, that's six figures. Like, what the? Mm-hmm. In high school, that's irresponsible. Judging, but not judging. Um, so we came with that thing where we wanted our our children to show they're my children. So if I have status, they have to mm-hmm. show status. That's on us. That's not yeah. them. But I'm saying, even when it came down to the starter homes, you know, most everyone I know started at, 2,000 yeah. square feet or bigger. No, right. I don't know anyone has started. And, not, and that, that they're rich. Yeah. No, I'm not saying so, that so expectation. I of, guess what I'm trying to get at is that... Is that but that's there's not a credit card. A, well, but there's a number of, of things that have changed socially as well as, as, as financially, as we've seen, that have created almost this perfect storm of expectation where, you know, our quality of life has improved, right? I mean, I guess you could argue we all live in... We saw last night, we were watching that um, the baseball game, and they said that, you know, back in 1910, something like 15% of the houses had toilets. Mm-hmm. I mean, 1910, that wasn't that long ago. And now our expectation is you're going to live in a house with air conditioning, and you're going to live in a house, perhaps a garage, on the, so many square feet. So our expectations have changed. I was about to get our off quali- topic. Our quali- <laughs> shocking. Our quality of life has improved, but the, it's also the cost of life has, has increased as well. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about is – what do you think, as an org- as a comp- as a country, we can do to try? What are what are some of the key things? If if you were running for office, what were the two or three things you'd do to try to control the affordability crisis? How how do we make housing more affordable? Let's let's start there. How would we make housing more affordable? I would. So this is my presidential speech. There you go. America, come in. <laughs> First of all, we need to revamp. And yes, this is personal. And I'm fine now, but we really need to to advance our credit system. Mm-hmm. It, this the way this this FICO system, the way we do credit, it is unfair. It is unjust and imbalanced. And I'm going to give you a part. Why do you say that, Tricia? I'll tell you, because what it's a system that says up a, a lot of our structure and system in America is set up to award the reward the rich. And so FICO is another way. So they say if you're absolutely perfect, if you, you know, you have X amount in a bank and you do all this, never miss a payment, we're going to make it easy for you to get credit. So you're going to make it easier for the people who need credit the less to get more credit. Mm -hmm. So for poor people who actually can't make it from day to day, who needs grace, grace is credit, great credit buys you time for the people that need grace. You make it harder. You charge them more. So I pray America's listen. This system is broke and it's flawed. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to the last podcast we talked about, Scott Galloway. But it goes back to his point of like, 
you know, so you put money into social security and you pay all of this in. If you have five, six, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, why are you taking down social security? Mm -hmm. You don't need it. So we need to create a system. So you're you not ask answering me, my question. I'm, uh, I'm going to bring you back. That, what, I, I, want, I want was, actionable things. In, in, the last 20, in the last 28 years, Toby. houses have gone from $78,000. No, no, stay with me. In the last 28 years, houses have gone from $78,000 to $433,000. Mm -hmm. How do we make them more affordable? I want, I want actionable steps. And I understand personal. credit. Credit works for me. Because first of all, they got to be able to buy the house. So we how, do we gotta, make, we gotta, how do we make home housing cheaper? How do we make housing cheaper? We start, what will make housing cheaper if we have more, and Bishop T.D. Jakes is working on this too, where he's got a billion dollar funding with Wells Fargo to do more mixed income communities. Mm -hmm. What created this disparity is when we start saying, I'm over here, you over there. This zip code is versus this, and you're next to me. And because we drew this line, so once we start having more mixed income communities, mm -hmm. these and these properties will not appreciate at the level that they're going. We will have more balance mm -hmm. and we'll have more affordability. Mm -hmm. But the minute where you say, because I'm over here and I'm in this zip code. So that's where we can start. Mm -hmm. We can start saying, how do we bring more unity, more diversity, more diverse incomes mm -hmm. into communities? That's going to start. We need to get rid of red line. I'll be here all day. It's a thousand things well, I, I can do. I just want to blood, be, hammer them because things there are so interesting points. should not be red lining. Should be unconstitutional. It should be against the law. You should not be able to draw a line in America and say because you are of this race or this social economic background, this line is drawn because I mm. need to protect their property from mm. yours. Until we start green back, and this is not me. Just saying, take from the rich and give to the poor. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm saying. That's saying, let's erase all of these lines that separate us to mm -hmm. begin with. How do we get builders to start building low-cost housing as opposed to building high-cost housing? How, how do we incent a, a lower-cost housing? Because that's the challenge. I mean, I was in Tor Toronto a couple weeks ago, and everybody's building high-cost housing. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we incent builders to build low-cost housing? To fix this, to, to lower this gap. But it goes back to saying there is a way. So they bought this up when it when it came down to, I hate to bring his name up again, Scott Galloway. But when they were talking about the tax and revamp and our tax code and our tax system, here's a thought. It, it's, it, it's not like we're transferring wealth, but more people factually, and I had this in my notes, I want to say this quickly. Um, they brought this up in a podcast and they said that Simon Sinek um, bought this up and said, he was like, I did a quick study. He was like Rockefeller, Carnegie, um, and a lot of the rich pe people who were rich during the Victorian era. There was no tax code. They they didn't give incentives for them to give back. But everyone knows that Carnegie, he you may have whatever issues you want to have with them, but there was philanthropy when there was no tax incentive. Mm -hmm. So I'm going somewhere. So these people were given, be it the Brits and Americans, back in the Victorian days. And we know Carnegie, we still have Carnegie Hall and other places. Carnegie Deli. Yeah. No, it's not the hush to tell you. But um, so they gave, even when there's no tax incentives, he goes, why did they give? Because back then they felt that there was a moral obligation to give. You know, and, and that's what they gave. When there was no tax incentive, they have a moral obligation to give. And he made a point. If we revamp the tax codes and structures and, and, and where people can actually get a chance to say, OK, now we're not you're going to pay a little more, but you get to say where your money go. I think that would change all of this. I think people I, that make more will be more amped to give when you yeah. could say, OK, you know what? I can have this as the, the Malbec Institute of whatever the case may be. Then we start changing the tax code, changing those things. And giving people who pay more different initiatives to put their money mm -hmm. to. And then we can start making changes because now we can have home endowments and say, you know what? I want my money to go to a lot of the deals mm -hmm. with, you know, the plight of the homeless and mm -hmm. all of these things. And yeah. that's yeah, but, the Malbec Institute of tomfoolery is what we're going to do. But, uh, we tried to boil the ocean in the last two episodes, we did. two podcasts. A lot. We want to hear from you. Give us some ideas of topics you'd like us to cover along this line. 
because there's a lot to cover as we as we try to really fix up some some screwed up stuff. And some of it's our fault, some of it's not. Some of it's you know technology running amok. Some some of it's just us not keeping up with what's going on. But um, we we appreciate you taking the time with us today, um, and we appreciate the feedback you guys always give us. And uh, until we see you again, I do want to say until we see you again. I do want to say we do encourage you guys to to subscribe to to join us because ideally we really want to get not we're, we're not just doing this to to get numbers up that's great i really want to get to the point where we have a big enough following and support so we can have live conversations i want to have live conversations because i want feedback we really want to do what we can to be some kind of instrument of change and give everyone a voice so that's important. So subscribe. I don't even like saying like us because I'm like, like me, please like me. <laughs> but please. And for those of you older people who don't know how to subscribe, because I had that happen too. Like I keep pushing a button, not the button you see on the screen and in, in YouTube, it's a button beneath that says subscribe and it'll give you a little bell. But yeah, we really want to go live. We really want your feedback, your participation. So until we get meet again, we'll see you on the perch. Take the Take higher care. ground.